Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is Mike Consul, your host. In addition to being the host of this podcast and interviewing novelists, I am a novelist myself. I have three published novels. My latest is titled Lolita Firestone, a supernatural novel, and it is set in Sedona, Arizona and Cairo, Egypt. My previous novel is titled Family Recipes, a novel about Italian culture, Catholic guilt, and the culinary crime of the century. And my first novel is named Hardwood, a novel about college basketball and other games young men play. And that story deals with issues ranging from depression and racism to sex, religion, and university politics. All three novels are listed in the episode notes. I hope you will buy them. I hope you will read them, and I hope you will thoroughly enjoy them. Now, on with our program. Every serious fiction writer I've ever known can identify a book or two that were seminal to their maturation or inspiration as an author. For me, there were three. There was A World According to Garp by John Irving. There was White Noise by Don DeLillo. And then there was Bright Lights, Big City by Jay McInerney. When I, the book had, had attracted a lot of attention, I decided to buy a copy. It was hip, exciting, energetic, and it was written in a fresh style. It was written in second person as opposed to first or third person, like the vast majority of books are written. And so there's a constant you being told, you, the reader, you, the person out there. In fact, let me just read a, a sh short excerpt from Bright Lights and Big City, just to underscore that the, the power of the second person uh, writing style. Just outside the door, you spot her, tall, dark, and alone, half hidden behind a pillar at the edge of the dance floor. You approach laterally, moving your stuff like a bad spade through a, a slalom of synthesized conga rhythm. She jumps when you touch her shoulder. Dance? She shakes her head. Why is she looking at you as if you have tarantulas nesting in your eye sockets? You are by any chance Bolivian or Peruvian? She is looking around for help now, remembering the recent encounter with a young heiress bodyguard at Danceteria. Or was it the red parrot? You back off, hands raised over your head. Just as an example, again, that's quoting a, a short passage from Bright Lights, Big City. Not only was it written in second person, but the protagonist is never really named in the book. And no. uh, further immersing the reader into the story in a way that uh, you could be the protagonist, that the story is about the reader himself or herself. That right. book absolutely exploded on the scene. 700,000 copies sold is, is the last count that I had heard, plus tens of thousands a year, a year for years after that. That book was authored by the man in the spotlight during this episode. His name is Jay McInerney, of course. The guy really needs no introduction. Uh, Jay McInerney is the author of 12 books. They include the aforementioned Bright Lights, Big City, Model Behavior, The Good Life, uh, his short story collection, How It Ended, was named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times. His work has appeared in New York Magazine, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, New York Times Book Review, The Times Literary Supplement, New York Review of Books, on and on. He also writes a monthly wine column. We'll talk a little bit about wine and grapes and uh, the magical effect uh, of, of wine and social situations and such. That uh, monthly wine column he wrote for Town and Country, and uh, previously wrote a wine was a wine columnist for the Wall Street Journal and House and Garden, and many of those columns were collected in a book titled Bacchus and Me, Bacchus being the god of wine, and uh, also a book titled A Hedonist in the Cellar. And in 2006, Jay McInerney was named James Bird, James Beard, M. F. K. Fisher Award. Uh, recipient for distinguished writing. And in 1989, he was named Literary Lion uh, by the New York Public Library. Um, some of his other books include uh, uh, titles uh, such as The um, Last of the Savages and The Last Bachelor uh, and The Business and so on. Jay McInerney, uh, thank you for coming on the program. My pleasure. 
I, I just can't, I forgot, can't. I'd forgotten half of that, but <laughs> I, I did a ring a bell when I was reading some of the uh, some of the excerpt from the book. Good, good to know. I just when when I was named a literary lion, I remember uh, sneaking off to the bathroom with uh, Hunter Hunter Thompson, and uh, well, now you're in trouble. <laughs> sharing sharing some of his um, <clears throat> excellent drugs before trying to get back to the. The dinner party that was celebrating us. <laughs> well, this is such a signature book for the era. And um, it, this was really any author's dream. Here, here's your first novel. And uh, you, my understanding is that you and your publisher didn't really expect it to do what it did. Uh, the, no. They were expecting it to sell some books, but it it became a huge sensation. Um and that, that's that's the case that that uh, it was like wow we we weren't expecting this but here we go. Yeah, well, I was honestly I was just kind of expe uh, I was hoping to get enough good reviews that I could that I could get a teaching job out of the whole thing. Um, you know, the book was as you mentioned earlier it was written in the second person, which isn't perhaps the, at least at, at the time we didn't think it was the most reader friendly mode and. Um, uh, and it was, you know, it was considered in-house. It was considered a fairly literary book, you know, that is. It was not considered, you know, Jacqueline, Suzanne, Frederick Forsyth kind of bestseller <laughs> material uh, to name some bestsellers of the era. And, um, you know, I remember Jason Epstein, who was the president of Random House at the time, took me out to lunch and he, he was fortunately a fan of the book, which, which was really how it got published. He took me out to lunch at Lutas and bought me some very expensive wine. And he, and, but he warned me, he said, first of all, he said, number one, people your age don't read anymore. I was 27 at the time, I believe. And, um, and he said, number two, people, uh, people don't care about New York city. New York city is not a good subject for a book. Um, I subsequently, uh, well, many, many people who followed in my wake subsequently pro proved that wrong since their, their, their bright lights partly spawned a huge avalanche of books about New York. Um, yes. Culminating with the bonfire of the vanities. Uh, and, um, and, and thirdly, he said, it's written in the second person, which is kind of weird, but he said, I happen to like it, but, but he just basically said, don't get your hopes up. And that was the feeling in house. I think we, I think the first printing was five thousand copies, and and uh, we were all flabbergasted when the first printing immediately sold out, um, largely on word of mouth. And at that time, it took six weeks to to reprint a book. So the feeling then, of course, was that it would die in those six weeks because everybody would forget about it. Um, no, unfortunately, it didn't. Fortunately, the lack of product only sort of fed the appetite for the book, it seems. And uh, and so suddenly, before I knew it, I was the toast of the town. And I was, um, <laughs> the, the, the book was selling tens of thousands of copies a week. And, and uh, movie rights were sold. And every actor of that generation was courting me in order to play the lead role. People like... Tom Hanks and Alec Baldwin and Tom Cruise and, and Rob Lowe and on and on and on. I saw the movie, but I don't remember who was the lead role. <laughs> um, it was a long well, time ago. The movie was <clears throat> the movie was actually written by me, which was probably a mistake. Uh, one of the reasons it wasn't <laughs> as it could have been, uh, since I am not a professional screenwriter. Uh, but it was. Um, it starred Tom, uh, sorry, uh, Michael J. Fox, who at that time was sort of the hottest. Oh, that's right. Uh, the hottest actor out there. The problem was that he was, you know, he was known for this very clean cut role in a TV show called Family Ties. Yes. And his image and my image were, you know, diametrically opposed. As it turns out, we were quite similar. Um uh, personally, uh, we ended up spending an awful lot of nights on the town in New York while he was filming, filming uh, *Bright Lights, Big City*. How how he ever made it to the set at six in the morning every every day, I have no idea. 
Um, <laughs> Why but, six uh, in the morning? He had he had other obligations later in the day, so it had to be done early. No, that's just when they start filming movies. Is it okay. six in the morning? Hmm. One one of the reasons that. I probably didn't go into the film business, <laughs> uh, being a night person myself. But, um, but you know, Tom, I mean, Tom is a very, I'm <clears throat> sorry, Michael is a very good actor. I, I keep saying Tom because Tom Cruise for six or eight months was scheduled to be the, to be the lead. And Tom followed me around the New York nightclubs and so on in order to basically base the part on me. Uh, and then, there were delays in production and along came this movie called Top Gun. And so Tom ran off and did Top Gun. Michael J. Fox came along and um, he was, he was a great actor, but his, his image was such that it was very hard for his fans to see him in, in a sort of decadent New York role, which involved him snorting a lot of Coke and, um, uh, so his, I don't think his fans were, were pleased and my, my smaller legion of fans were definitely not pleased with, with my yeah. character being played by this incredibly clean cut, you know, happens so Republican often, happens so often. Guys. So, um, I, I people come up to me, you know, every, every month or every week, even say they just saw the movie because it's always playing somewhere but um i'm i'm not a big fan of the movie uh, i i just think i was i failed to figure out how to translate the 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 very unusual narrative of the novel into onto film um yeah the, that's was, the key i mean to any listener out there read the book don't don't uh i mean see the movie but read the book if you're only going to do one thing read the book yeah. because as you say it's the, the narrative is just not something that translates so well on, on the film and, and you don't get the sense of immersion in in the movie yeah. and also it was directed by a guy um, um james bridges who's a very good director but he was at the time he must have been 62 years old 65 years old uh, you know i'm afraid i'm that old now but um but he 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 just didn't get it you know, I mean, he, he didn't really understand the subset, subtext of the novel. He didn't understand why people wait outside nightclubs for hours trying to get in. And he didn't really understand the allure of what was inside. I mean, just to use one example. Right, right. So, it, so I mean, it just, uh, it wasn't, it, at the time it was the number one movie, but it really wasn't a great success. The other thing that, that happened was that by the time they filmed the movie, you know, uh, Len Bias, the basketball player, had died of a cocoa. Yes, I remember. And, and Nancy Reagan was 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 going full steam ahead on this "Just Say No" campaign, and there was a great fear among the filmmakers of glamorizing uh, decadence and cocaine use and so on. So, so we we had a bit of a problem <laughs> even i before. can imagine so you didn't get a lot of pushback on second person that was like well you know it's a little odd compared to most books but they didn't really push back hard uh the book uh great thing is most, most people didn't notice it <laughs> yeah that's amazing to me because that that to me was such a mark of distinction of the book um the 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 immediate success that you and i de describe for us what it was like to go from you know an aspiring author to suddenly being the toast of new york i'm sure that you were invited to every literary party in new york city and were rubbing yeah. shoulders with tom wolf and norman mailer and yeah. yeah and hunter doing doing uh some things with hunter thompson yeah it was i mean it was it was pretty extraordinary i was i was an unemployed i was an unemployed would-be author who had recently been fired from the new yorker for being a bad, bad fact checker, um, like the character in the book, yeah, yeah, and I and I had I had recently enrolled in the PhD program, uh, literary program at uh, at Syracuse University, mainly so I could rub shoulders with Raymond Carver, who was teaching mm -hmm. there at the time, and um, um, and suddenly I found myself, you know, flying flying to New York City <laughs> from Syracuse, New York, of all places you know, like twice a week and getting interviewed on the Today Show and um, and having drinks with Mick Jagger, who was interested in 
having me <laughs> interview him for Esquire magazine and uh, uh, yeah, getting in, getting invited. I'd, I'd been living in New York for three years before this, before I retreated in disgrace to uh, Syracuse. So I knew New York pretty well. And suddenly all these nightclubs that I had trouble getting into were, were begging me to uh, grace their dance floors. Um, you know, yeah. I remember, yeah, yeah. I remember <laughs> about this time, a, a nightclub called the Palladium opened up. And it was this huge Steve Rubell production. Um, it was the biggest nightclub that had ever opened. And it was sort of the apotheosis of that whole idea. After, after You know, nightclubs were supposed to be underground. They weren't supposed to be you know, big media sensations. But anyway, there must have been a thousand people at the door of this place trying to get in. And I was with some friends of mine uh, way at the back of the line. And and we basically said, oh, hell, we, <laughs> we might as well give up on this. And suddenly the doorman sees me, waves me, plows through the the, the crowd of hundreds of people and, and drags me inside. And that was that was pretty much the way that it, <laughs> that yeah. it went for the next uh, few years. Um, they want the right people in the club. This, this was one of the first times that I had ever experienced, uh, you know, the power of, of this new celebrity of mine. And it was, I mean, mostly it was, mostly it was great, but of course there was Did the Did it scare you at all? Was any of it scary? Yeah. yeah. Well, I wasn't smart enough to be scared, but <laughs> you're still but, young and having just a great time. Yeah, I was, just, I was having a good time, but, but there was certainly a backlash. You know, there were a lot of people who felt that a novelist should not be in this position and that um, a novelist shouldn't be a celebrity and that I was somehow selling out. And, uh, and, you know, there was a lot of resentment. Um, you know, I, 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 it was funny. I recently found something online, um, that um, was written was written about twenty years ago, but it basically said uh, if I if I had had a worse haircut and dressed more poorly um, uh, and looked more like a doofus, uh, my literary reputation would be much higher than <laughs> than it was at the time. I, I, I get it. I get it. <laughs> you know, you mentioned power, uh, the the power of celebrity, uh, but. Your power also was uh, one of the ways it expressed itself is that uh, Brett Easton Ellis and Tama Janowitz came along as well. And and I think your book fueled their rise as novelists yeah. as well. And the three of you were, were members of the so-called Brat Pack in the 1980s, yeah. novelists who came along and and um, uh, with this whole new sort of um, um, style and, and vision. Are, are all three of you still in touch? Well, um, two of us are in touch, uh, but the, um, yeah, it was a funny thing because Brett, so Brett's book was published. I can't remember. I actually reviewed Tama's uh, first uh, book for the New York times and I gave it a pretty good review. Uh, Brad came along about nine months later and his editor was a great friend of mine named Morgan Entrican. And he said, I've just found this book. It's amazing. He said, I'm going to promote it as the West Coast Bright Lights Big City. And I said, hmm, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, I subsequently read the book and met Matt Bratt on some literary panel. And uh, and we really kind of hit it off. Uh, and even though, in my mind, we were quite different writers, our styles were were very different, our subject matters were similar. Uh, you know, the young young people... Uh, nightlife, drugs, and so on. Um, and and really, the media can only deal with, the media can't deal with style. They can't deal with um, uh, the difference between, you know, rom romanticism and, 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 uh, and stoicism. And they, um, um, so they, they love the fact that Brat and I were like, you know, we were both these young people writing about writing about subject matter that hadn't made it into literature for a long time. You know, not since Jack Kerouac, really. And so we got lumped together and then Tama came along and she got lumped in with us, I guess. Um, again, having similar subject matter. Um, um, so we all we all found ourselves at the same parties and getting the same invitations and uh 
And and it's always much easier for, I mean, not to sound like Donald Trump, but it's it's much easier for the media to um to write about groups than it is about individual objects, you know. Um uh you know three's three's company. Uh we 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 suddenly were a a phenomenon, and um, and that in turn inspired a lot of other young writers to follow in our footsteps. So, and and that again <laughs> created more backlash in the long run. But 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 yeah. But we were um, there's no question that we had a large impact on the culture at a certain moment and. Um, for some people, that was a very good thing. For some people, not so good. Um, yeah, yeah. Brett, Brett, I'm still close with Rat, and I see him a lot when when I'm on the West Coast. Um, Tama apparently, uh, Tama wrote a memoir recently, and and although I didn't know this until recently, she was furious at me because at some point I was asked why I didn't do uh, vodka and clothing ads and. And I said, I thought the writers should not, you know, compromise their veracity by, you know, selling their endorsements. And um, and Tama was doing that very thing. And so she was furious at me for years, although I didn't realize it. <laughs> so I think, I'm, <laughs> I think I'm on her shit list. Um, yeah, it's what it sounds like. But, but, Brett, sounds but, but Brett and I really did become close friends. And... Um, and there was a point where we, you know, we had dinner every Friday night, and uh, we've sort of figured if the press is going to throw us together, we might as well just go for it. And um, and then he 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 ended up he ended up borrowing some of my characters, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's cheating. <laughs> well, I just I, I think I think it was a big joke to him, and it was pretty funny, and I ultimately. After a brief moment of bristling, I thought it was pretty funny too. Uh, so, so let me, so, let me ask you about. I haven't known. I I don't think anything quite like that has happened since. You know, um, for better or for worse. You know, I, I I don't feel like there's. You know, I mean, back before us, there were the Beats. You know, Ginsburg and yes. Burroughs, Kerouac, and to some extent, Gore Vidal and Norman Mailer and Truman Capote formed sort of a triumvirate and they were on talk shows and people knew who they were. I, I, I don't know if that happens anymore. Yeah. I mean, there's still obviously celebrity writers around, but maybe not to the the same degree. There's so many other distractions these days. Uh, I mean, it was Philip Roth who said the novels, uh, the year of the novel is over. Uh, I don't know that that I believe that I'm going to ask you about that, but first I want to ask you the, here you are, there's a saying, that a rock band or any any band has your your whole life to write your first album and six months yeah. to write your second album. <laughs> you must have come off Bright Lights Big City. Uh, the publishing company must have been excited and said, you got to get another book out there, uh, Jay. So let's go for it. Yeah. And you have the pressure of this uh, of this freshman success. And there's something called the sophomore jinx. Yeah. You write a book called Ransom that you were happy with, but didn't did not uh, meet the expectation. I mean, it didn't equal Bright Lights, Big City. Talk, talk about how, I mean, were you conscious of that pressure and did, were they pressing you to get another book out there rapidly? Well, you know, I actually had another book. <laughs> um, um, Ransom was, I don't know, probably three quarters written when I sort of took time off to to write Bright Lights, Big City. Uh, you know, Ransom was a very traditional kind of expatriate novel based on my two years of living in Japan. And I was just having trouble with it. And so it was it was sort of like having a, having an affair on your wife. Uh, I just I just kind of cheated on Ransom by writing Bright Lights Big City in about six weeks. And um, uh, suddenly I was compelled by this the second person voice in this story about the worst things that had ever happened to me in my life up to that point. And, and I put ransom aside. So when bright lights was out there, I had something else to, 
to publish. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I spent another three weeks or, I mean, uh, three months or so on Ransom. And then I published it. The, the problem is that Ransom is definitely a first novel <laughs> and a kind of a apprentice effort. And I... I think it was the wrong novel to publish right after Bright Light's Big City. And also everybody wanted me to write about New York. You know, they didn't want me to write about karate in Japan and so on. Uh, although subsequently there, <laughs> there was there was a bit of a rash of, of Americans in Japan novels, some of which some of which were well received. But Ransom Ransom was basically an apprentice work, which I published after a really successful first novel. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm glad you mentioned six weeks because that's one of the other um, uh, things about Bright Lights, uh, Big City is uh, you often hear artists of all stripes say that my greatest work that I've, that I've ever done or the greatest works that I've ever done, they came very quickly because yeah. they had incubated, they had developed, uh, they'd coalesce, and then it was just bam. Uh, that appears to have been the case with with Bright Lights. Uh yeah. Uh, how, uh, describe that a little bit. Did 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 you was this something that you had incubating in in your head for for months or years, and then uh, when you decided it's time to pull the trigger on it, it really just just spilled out. Well, it must have been. Um, so back in oh boy, I'm trying to think of dates now, but back around 1981, I I I was writing short stories and. I, I sent I sent a short story off to the Paris Review, and um, George Plimpton liked the story. But he called me up, and, and I, I can't even imitate his, his his voice. It's very it's very funny. But he 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 asked me if I had any anything else to send him, and so <clears throat> that night I I went through kind of everything in my drawer. And the only thing that I could find that I thought was interesting was was this paragraph I had written at like four in the morning after coming home from a nightclub. And it was basically the first paragraph of Bright Lights Big City. You're not the kind of guy who would be at a place like this at this time of the morning, but here you are. Um, and so on and so on. Um, I had scribbled this down um, back in 1980 after a sort of disastrous night in a nightclub. And I thought, this is the only original thing in my pile of works in progress. Um, I mean, the voice struck me as really original. So that night, I pretty much stayed up all night and and I wrote a short story. Um, it's only about 12 pages about a guy at a nightclub who's trying to heal his broken heart, unsuccessfully, of course, and who's whacked out of his mind on cocaine. And... Um, and then I sent that to, to George Plimpton. Uh, it was called, it's 6 a.m., do you know where you are? I love uh, that line. <laughs> so um, Plimpton immediately called me and said, I'm, I'm, I'm publishing this. And, but he, to, to, the, to the point where I couldn't even make any corrections, which I tried to do. He, he just ran it in no time at all. <laughs> and it, it, it caused a stir, you know. In the literary world, people were kind of excited by it and, so I, and I was still struggling with this Japan novel. And one day I woke up in the morning and I said, what if I just try to keep going with this, uh, with this short story in the second person? Uh, and frankly, it had taken me a while to realize it was in the second person. And, uh, and, and very, it was, a, it was a summer. So I was in graduate school, but it was, it just this, this might've been, you know, end of May when I sat down to write this thing. And, in very short order, about six weeks, I, I I wrote a short novel, which in the end was called Bright Lights Big City. Went through many titles, um, and my my um, my roommate from Williams College was working at Random House at the time. I sent it to him, and he gave it to Jason Epstein, and suddenly, uh, <laughs> uh, suddenly, I had a publishing contract. And this was a signature novel of the 1980s. Talk about, com compare and contrast the 1980s versus where we are now. Here we are in 2024. <laughs> the world has changed a lot. Technologically, it's changed a lot. Socially, it's changed a lot. Um, 
talk talk about the 80s versus where we are today. Well, you know, it's funny. In the 80s, in some ways, they have this reputation of, you know, of the dec the decadent decade, you know. Um uh and and it, one of the interesting things about the 80s is that it's it's really the last decade that has a signature visual style, you know. You know, if you see if you see a photograph of me in 1985, you know it's 1985 between the clothing and the haircut and so on. Mm -hmm. and, or and but likewise the the architecture, and the cars and everything. Um, but the 80s was supposed to be so decadent with the with the cocaine and the fact that the Dow Jones Industrial Average hit 3,000 and uh, you know, Wall Street bankers were throwing their weight around and so on. And uh, they were doing a lot of cocaine, too. They were doing, yeah. But, but when you look back at it now, the, the 80s seemed kind of quaint and almost cute compared to what has, what has followed. Uh, and, uh, but it was a smaller world then. It was, um, uh, you know, without social media, without so-called quality television um uh we, we, you know without the internet it was just um uh, it, it, it was an easier world to navigate really uh on the other hand um <clears throat> it was also scary and almost apoc apocalyptic in the sense that in my community in particular which was downtown creative new york you suddenly had this plague which arose amongst us uh, called, you know, which was AIDS, of course. And uh, we were, we were pretty freaked out, um, you know, more than, you know, the, the crowd that I traveled in was at least half gay. And uh, suddenly people were getting sick. People were getting these uh, mm. Kaposi sarcoma sort of blotches on their, on their skin people were dying and it took a while to figure out what was going on. And, and, you know, half a generation of creative people kind of got scythed down. Um, um, so on the one hand, there was this incredible innocence and exuberance. And then on the other hand, uh, you know, death was, was, was stalking us. Um, you know, I don't think there will be another decade like it. And, and, and likewise, I, as I said, I don't, I don't think there will be, I don't think there is any longer the opportunity for a, a novelist to make, uh, make a, a cultural impact that, 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 that some did at that time. Does that suggest that you agree with Philip Roth that the era of the novel is over? Ah, well, unfortunately, that's what that tends to be what like seventy-five-year-old guys say when they're when they're on their way out <laughs> when they're running out of material. <laughs> yeah, when they're exactly. Although to his credit, he didn't really run out. Of no, he was uh, God. He could be he so productive he, he, in his late years. That's got to be inspirational to you or any uh, novelist out there. But you know, I wonder if if I were, you know, if if I were fifteen-year-old Jay McInerney now. I wonder if I would consider the novel to be the most vital form of communication as I did back when I was 15 years old. And I'm not sure that I would. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I was utterly dedicated to that mission, that goal. Um, what would you tell us? So many, there's so you... many more ways to, uh, to express yourself and to reach the public now. Um, Exactly. And there's no question that, you know, if I, 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 my, my heroes were Hemingway and Fitzgerald and James Joyce. And, you know, those guys were, they, they were the cultural icons of their, of their time. Yeah. And they were the, they were the ones who, to me, were the most creative. Well, since painting and music didn't come naturally to me, they were, they were the most creative figures of, of their time. Um, well what uh, what would you say to a 25 year old Jay McInerney knowing what you know now if you could go back in time to that 15 year old or 20 or 25 year old Jay McInerney what what uh, sentence what piece of advice would you just uh, can convey and just say L listen um, I, I want to want to give you a, give you a little guidance here and just keep this in mind what, what would you tell that uh, your young self um, I might tell my <laughs> My young self, something that Norman Mailer said to me when we were we were walking from a 
some sort of movie premiere to the restaurant where we we're going to have the dinner to celebrate the movie. And uh, Norman and I in particular were being swarmed by photographers. Uh, and also Norman had his very beautiful wife, Norris, with him. Uh, and uh, he, Norman said to me, be careful of those flash bulbs, Jay. They can bleach your soul. And um, he, what he meant by that, obviously, was, <clears throat> you know, be careful of how you embrace this celebrity. And, um, you know, I, th I think if I if I had the chance to go back, I would I would embrace it a little less <laughs> because I don't know, it's it's uh, it's very seductive and it's very dangerous. Like, you know, like like a beautiful, fickle woman who may be gone the next morning before you before you realize it yeah the norwegian wood syndrome <laughs> yes so uh, did you did this take you away from your work uh, the celebrity was such that you know you you uh, enjoyed it uh at the time anyway did did you find that you were doing less writing because you were too involved in the nightlife well you know fortunately when you're young you're very driven and uh i think that i <clears throat> You know, I can I continue to work pretty steadily, but yeah, there's there's probably a book somewhere, a ghost book somewhere back there that didn't get written, <laughs> which mm -hmm. which I read. Um, you know, if I hadn't written the screenplay, there certainly would have been another novel. Um, I guess I'm glad I wrote the screenplay because you know I made a lot of money and uh, I, I I learned from my mistakes. But one of the things I learned is that I'm a novelist and not a screenwriter. I've, I've, I've subsequently written maybe 10 of them, but I'm still not very good. <laughs> <laughs> do you see, uh, I, I don't want to spend the time talking just about Bright Lights, Big City, but do you see that book uh, as an annoyance as well that uh, all people want to talk about is Bright Lights, Big City, but I've written all this other material that I think is good and people don't reference it nearly as much as Bright Lights, Big City. Is it in a sense uh, kind of uh, an annoyance? Well, there came there came a point in the middle of my career, really, where I just get so tired of talking about Brett Letts. And, and, you know, and I would get so tired of people coming up to me and say, oh, I love your book. And I, I would want to say, well, I've written 10. Which one are you talking about? <laughs> and, but that would be disingenuous. It was, it was um, yeah, I was, I was kind of sick of it for a while until eventually I realized that, you know, as I, as I said to you earlier, the, the goal – with Bright Lights Big City was getting a, a few good reviews and getting a teaching job somewhere in the Midwest. And instead I got a career as a full-time novelist and I was able to devote myself entirely to writing. And, um, and Bright Lights gave me a certain <laughs> fame, which still hasn't worn off entirely. And um, I, I finally did. And, and, you know, and I, Finally reread it a few years ago and decided, you know what, I'm pretty proud of this. So um now yeah. now I now now I've gotten over my resentment of Bright Lights Big City. But I, I certainly had it for a while. Well, and there's so many authors out there who have a particular novel that is the one that's gonna stand the test of time. And uh and they've written a lot of other great stuff, but but to have I mean, look at look at John Updike. I mean, he was, I forget who the critic was who said. John Updike's a, a great novelist who's never written a truly great novel. And, you know, um, that's funny you say that because I was trying to think, which which one are you about to mention? Because I can't. But for me, with John Updike, it's the Rabbit um, uh, trilogy or tetralogy, whichever. And in my case, in my case, I think certainly in terms of reviews, the best reviews I've gotten have been for this tetralogy, uh, this trilogy I wrote about this young glamorous New York couple starting, starting with the novel called Brightness Falls. And um, I don't know, I think in the long run, that may be the one that's, or that may be the accomplishment that's, that's talked about a little more. Um, Brightness Falls. Brightness Falls. Now, good, wasn't that, I, I'm, t I'm testing my memory right now. So check me on this. I thought you, I had read a quote from you in an interview situation where you said, I thought to myself, what would the bonfire of the vanities be like if it was, had been written with heart? And then yeah. you, is that, that right? 
that was certainly one of the things that I threw out there. But also I was thinking of, I was thinking of, you know, the, the social novels of like, you know, Vanity Fair, and, you know, Thackeray and Trollope and Dickens. And I was thinking, what if, what if somebody, you know, what if I wrote a, 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 a more panoramic novel of New York City in the 80s and uh, uh, more like the 19th century social realism uh, novels. And so that was what started me off on Brightness Falls, which I don't know. In my mind, in my mind, that's the best written of all of my books. Um, and I subsequently sort of revisited those characters every ten years um, for the for the next uh, well, next thirty years, I guess. And then, and the last installment was called "Bright Precious Days," and it's uh, I don't know that may have been the best reviews I ever got from my in my career. And huh. I just and I just finished. <laughs> I just finished a novel, which is going to end it all, uh, called which, see, you, "See You on the Other Side." Um, what, why did you say you're going to end it all? Well, one of the main, um, <laughs> this is the last one. I mean, it 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 ends this series at least because uh, one of the main characters dies. So I can't. I really can't. Ah, uh, I see. I, okay, I did that deliberately. <laughs> you killed off uh, a character. You have to. You have to do that sometimes. Yeah, but I, you know, but. Well, I mean, fortunately, I have the next novel in mind, which has nothing to do with that series. But so you're but, still writing. And, and... I think I think John Updike's greatest achievement was was uh, the Rabbit uh, series of novels: Rabbit Run, Rabbit Redux. Rabbit well, he won two Pulitzer prizes for those. Yeah. Um, my favorite was Villages. I, I, I he never wrote Villages. A, he, he never wrote a book like Catch Twenty Two or Catcher in the Rye or Yes, um, yeah. And, I guess in Mailer's case, it was the naked and the dead. Um, yeah, for I sure. I wrote a lot, of, a lot of good books uh, without, yeah, writing one of those books that that uh, displaced the others. Really, you know, um, it, it's interesting. I, I think his career at the moment is a bit in the his reputation is a bit in the doldrums compared to someone like Roth, who was his main competitor. Yeah, yeah. Was, I think so. You know, in 2010, you delivered a commencement speech at Williams College, which is your alma mater. What did you tell the students? Uh, <laughs> I, I think the uh, the short version is "fake it until you make it." Um, <laughs> I, I I mean, just just to put it in terms of writing, I talked about um, uh, the fact that for the first five years of my writing life. I just imitated everybody that I liked. I imitated Hemingway and I imitated Fitzgerald and Opta. Carver. Did you Carver. imitate Carver? Oh yeah, Carver. When I was in when I was in graduate school, everybody was Carver was it. Everybody was imitating Carver. And as different as he as different as his sensibility and subject matter was from me, I was just to me, reading Carver for the first time was was like what it must have been like to read you know Hemingway back in 1925 uh, was the spareness of the writing and spareness of the perfection of the writing, the the, the, the imitation of dialogue, the, um, the the economy. You know, it was just really something. And I think Carver was consciously imitating Hemingway to some extent, but um, mm -hmm. um, and so he, he became. He became a mentor to me, even though we could not be more different stylistically in, in terms of subject matter. I mean, <laughs> here was a guy who wrote about like laundromats and and bottles of ketchup on the on the table in the trailer park, and you know, like, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd never even been to a trailer park, <laughs> and he'd never been to New York City, and yet somehow we we became we we bonded, and he. he he read all my work for two years and and red penciled it. You know, he would say things to me like, "Why, why, why do you say Earth here, Jay? What, what you, what, you, what you mean is dirt. Don't, don't say Earth if you mean dirt. You know." And those those lessons stuck, even though I, I never wrote a book about um, working class people in the Pacific Northwest. Right, right. So. Um... 
I I'm on my third wife, so no judgment here, but you've been married three <laughs> times, like like me. Four. Um four times. Make that four. So um <laughs> is there something about uh your lifestyle about I realize this is a personal question about the temp uh, they always talk about artists being temperamental. Um you know, a good day of writing makes a guy happy, a bad day of writing, and uh, there's, uh, you know, petulant. Um, did, did the fact that you're a writer and the the that the vicissitudes of writing, did that, uh, was that a problem during any of your marriages? Well, I think my first wife was probably ambushed by the success of Right Lights Big City. I mean, it would have been very hard for any marriage to have, have survived what happened to me in 1984 uh, when suddenly I was just, you know, swamped by this wave of of attention and acclaim. And uh, she kind of got washed away by all of that. And, um, and, and, you know, she also, she was emotionally fragile in a way that particularly made her uh, susceptible to all of that. Um, um, you know, I, I, I would say that I have, I was probably subjected to more temptation than most people were at that time. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, You're and surrounded uh, by the beautiful people. And I have a, yeah. <laughs> and I have a relatively short attention span. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think Mailer had seven wives. So, uh, oh, yes. and Hemingway, well, Hemingway had four. So, yeah, it's it's a uh, uh, what, what what do they call that? That's a professional. When, when, when I married Anne, my current wife, she uh, she said, "All right, Hemingway had four, and that's all that's all you get." So, <laughs> yeah, that's a good stopping point right there. <laughs> yes, I, I I'm finished. <laughs> so the but current, I think, there was, I think there was also a certain. I mean, looking back, there was a certain sense that I was kind of experimenting with my own life and and almost blowing it up. To, to see what would happen so I could write about it, you know? I mean, I'm not proud of that, but I think it's possible that that's true. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's unusual either. I mean, uh, musically, I think that, uh, um, not, to, not to compare you two in any sense, but Taylor Swift seems to like to date guys <laughs> and break up with them and then write write an album about um, how it was really him who, who <laughs> and that, that she was the victim in the whole thing and, and writes these <laughs> laments. Um, now you are uh, currently working on something, uh, so I, I, it's good to hear that you're uh, you're not uh, haven't reached a point like Philip Roth eventually did and say, "Well, I'm retired now. I'm done." No, um, I, I, during the pandemic, I wrote a memoir. I wrote a short novel, which I'm still fooling around with, and I wrote. I just finished a month ago this this uh, this um, 400 page novel called um, "See You on the Other Side," which which God knows when it, you know. I haven't given it to my publisher yet, but I probably will in the next few months. So even, I mean, it seems like I haven't been doing much, but I, I actually have three books that um, are in the pipeline. So we'll, wow, we'll see, but no, I'm definitely not. And then I, I have the next one in my mind. So I haven't retired. <laughs> no, and you're not running out of ideas. It's not the sort of thing where you, it sounds like you've got a pipeline of ideas that. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I write journalism too, um, which I enjoy. And I write the, the wine criticism, which I enjoy. Let's talk about wine a little bit. You're obviously a connoisseur, a fancier, a connoisseur. Are you, do you have a pin? Uh, are you a sommelier? Have you studied it to that degree that you're a psalm or are, is it just that, you know, you're a connoisseur well, of wine? I'm, I'm... I'm an amateur. I mean, I think I've, I've won. I, I've won some. <laughs> I've won some uh, pins for my writing, but uh, um, it was just you know when I published Bright Lights Big City, uh, I suddenly had some money to spend on wine, and, and curiously enough, um, I got the phone call telling me that the book had been accepted at a liquor store in uh, Syracuse, New York. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> where I was working part time to. Uh, myself and so i it was it was kind of a crummy uh liquor store but but there was this shelf of like really good bordeaux and stuff which was gathering dust because mostly we sold to winos um but uh so i took home the best bottle i could find there that night and uh, opened it up and and even though i've had better wine since that may have been the best bottle in a sense of my life because 
you know, I just pop, just sold my first novel and um you had to celebrate, yeah. So what, then what? when I when I started making money from Bright Lights, um the 1982 Bordeaux vintage was released into the market. And um, this was one of the greatest vintages of modern times. And so I bought a whole bunch and, you know, I started reading. I, I befriended when I went on my European book tour, I befriended Julian Barnes, the novelist who's mm -hmm. also a great wine connoisseur. And so we started faxing each other about what wine we were drinking and, and it was just a hobby, but, in 1995, my friend Dominique Browning took over House and Garden magazine, and, and she wanted to have a wine column because she thought it was something people cared about now. And, um, and so she asked me to write about it. And I said, well, look, I don't really think I know enough. And she said, well, look, most write, wine writing is boring um, and technical and not of interest to the general reader. And she said, I, I think you could make it really fun and interesting, write about the people write about what you don't know. And so I agreed to do it for six months and I'm still doing it. <laughs> yeah. So five well, years well, later, I, well, I was the wine critic for the Wall Street Journal for four or five years. And after, after House and Garden folded, um, and now, that's a great now, gig. now I write, write for a couple of magazines, including town and country, um, and an English magazine called Noble Rot. And, um, I mean, it's a great, it's, it's sort of a relief from the fiction, you know, it's like some days, um, I shouldn't say this, but you know, if, if I should happen to on a rare occasion, wake up really hung over, uh, I can, I can still write about wine. <laughs> right. Right. What's your favorite grape? Pinot Noir. Yeah. Okay. Pinot, there Noir, you go. Pinot Noir is the base, it's the grape of Burgundy. Uh, and, um, to me, it has the most complexity and the most subtlety. Um, it has the, it has the ability to taste one way, uh, you know, in Chambon Musigny, and then right next door in Von Romanet, it tastes completely different. And and if you work at it hard enough, you can sometimes tell the difference um, blind without uh, without prompting. And it's um, I don't know. It's it, it, to me to me it but. <clears throat> It, it's also somewhat heartbreaking because it can be it can be really great and it can be really bad. It's like, yes, but you know yeah. it's it, it, it's it's like Pinot Noir fans are like Mets fans. You know, um, they're used to having their heart broken. Um, <laughs> and, and Cabernet fans are like are like Yankees fans. You know, they don't <laughs> they're used to winning. <laughs> so speaking, I'm glad you're pairing wines right now with uh, uh, something other than food, because I was going to ask you if uh, for the reader out there who just heard you say, I, yeah, I think Brightness Falls is my best written novel. So they're going to they're going to dive into Brightness Falls. What wine would you pair with Brightness Falls? Is that even a fair question? Could you uh, could you pair a, a particular wine with that novel? Well, with Brightness Falls, it, it probably wouldn't be a very it's such a big such a big sprawling book. I, I would probably compare it with a shot. Uh, well, I would probably pair it with a shot enough to pop from the Rhone Valley in France, mm. which, is, which is which is kind of what I was drinking back then too. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you uh, write under the influence of anything? Do you sip wine while you're writing? Do you ever use cannabis? Do you use caffeine? Um, is yes. there anything you write under the influence of? Uh, mostly caffeine. There was, um, you know, when I was. When I was waiting for Bright Light, when, when I went to George Plimpton's house, which was where all the great literary parties took place in New York when there still were such things. And and I met I met Truman Capote. It was really it was a very sad meeting, really. But, you know, Capote, uh, this is in 1984, and Capote kind of dragged me into George Plimpton's office and, and, of course, tried to grope me and whatnot. But he had a bag of cocaine, so I sort of put up with it. And, and we did some cocaine together. And and he said, you know, this is the great secret of writing. You know, you can write forever and brilliantly. And you know what? It isn't because I tried. I tried to write on Coke. And, you know, you sit down to write on Coke. And you, next thing you know, you're picking up the phone. You know, you're like, you know, you're 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 looking at the paper. You're, you're, cocaine, cocaine is a terrible, uh, a terrible stimulant for writing. Um the only, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've written under the influence of alcohol too, but I somehow don't in general find it to be the right kind of stimulus. The only 
the only time I use alcohol is <clears throat> if I've been writing all day, I will inevitably reward myself with, you know, a nice meal and some wine. And then sometimes I, I, I go back to my computer and the three or four pages that I wrote that day, I will then rewrite under the, you know, un somewhat under the influence of some wine. And sometimes it loosens things up in, in a good way. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's after it's already down on paper. So do you go out to eat a lot? I mean, do you run into Gay Talese uh, drinking his gin, his uh, gin uh, martini at, at the bar? I, yeah, I see. I see Gay a fair amount. He's uh, Gay. Gay is one of my Gay is one of my oldest literary friends in New York. I, a great, you know, I was, great I was guy. very lucky. Most of those most of those guys were very nice to me when I came along. Uh, Norman Mailer, Gay Talese, uh, Robert Stone. Um, uh, they they kind of you know they kind of embraced me and 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 uh encouraged me you know whereas they they, they could have been jerks um, exactly exactly you know, it's kind of like when shaquille o'neal joined the nba all all you know kareem jabbar and all the other I and mean, hakeem yeah. olajuwon they all were just uh yeah trying to sh let's show this kid this not nose kid a thing or two yeah uh, but they weren't that like that with you that that's it's a, a testament to their character william styron i mean they they were they were nice to me. They were, uh, you know, and they were intrigued, you know, like here's the, here's this young version of me out there. <laughs> um, I, exactly. I, I was pretty lucky that I, I was not always lucky with the, with the, what I call the guardians of the culture and the, the, the gatekeepers and the, the critics, but, but I was always lucky with the, uh, I was always taken care of by the older established writers as guys, guys like that talk about your writing regimen uh what what is your work ethic like and your work style are you a morning writer how long do yeah. you go uh where do you do your writing i'm mostly a morning writer i if i don't get started by noon i just feel like i've lost it but i i'm not an early morning person but but w when i'm really writing um the more involved in the novel I am, the earlier I get up, you know, so that let's say finishing, finishing up this recent book, uh, the last 10 days that I was at it, I was waking up earlier and earlier because I was thinking about it. And I was at my desk by 7.30, say, and um, working, working for, I don't know, five, six hours at a time. Um, in general, though, I don't get to my desk till about nine. I have some coffee, and then I come to my desk, and I work until you know I work until lunch. And if it's if, if it's good, then I might work after lunch. And if it's not good, I'm, I'm discouraged, and I don't work after lunch. <laughs> right, right. So a lot of times writers have these turning points in their career. Obviously, Bright Lights, Big City was it was a uh, you know it was the launch and, and and a turning point. Post Bright Lights, Big City. Was there a, a second turning point in your career, something, uh, a time when, when you suddenly took on a new direction or you found a new uh, confidence or maybe even just a different mindset that, that made you feel like, you know, this is chapter two for me right now? Well, I think, you know, my, my fourth novel was, was uh, what's called Brightness Falls. And that was, a, I mean, it was a big novel. It's like, it was almost 500 pages and it was, it was, um, and, and it was a, you know, panoramic novel that took place over two or three years and and uh and encompassed a lot of characters. And I, I think that was a turning point for me because, you know, all my novels up to that point had all taken place in a relatively short sp span of, you know, like a week, basically. And uh they'd been they'd been kind of snapshots. And this and that book was more like an album. And I thought, you know, I can I can do this. I can I can write the big ambitious novels, uh, and that, w w which is not to say that I would always do that because the the, the short punchy novel will always have its place. You know, Jul mm -hmm. Julian Barnes was always saying to me, "Why are you writing these long, long novels? You could you could write two two short novels in the same time." <laughs> do no novellas. Never write novels. Do novellas. Yeah, which is kind of what he does. But I don't know. Some some. Somehow, I like the idea of de dealing with multiple characters over time, and that that was that was a turning point for me. 
So speaking of over time, um, as you age, uh, your writing has changed as you've aged, but uh, you're still a young guy um, and you've got a lot of track ahead of you, God willing. Um, how do you think oh. your writing is going to change as you age? I mean, this one that you're coming out with now, which is about the, you know, the end. Um, this is the end. My only friend, the end. Um, uh, the end of this particular story. Yes, yes. But, but you know, uh, as, as people get older, they tend to write about death maybe more than when they're younger. But as you get older, do you um, say, you know, if you look 10, 20, 25 years down the road, do you think in uh -huh. terms of how your writing might change? Or how has it how has it changed to date, and how do you expect it to change going forward? Well, it's in, I just had brain surgery five weeks ago, so I'm trying to figure out what. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I, I'm serious. In December 20th, I had a really bad concussion, and uh, eventually I had to have brain surgery, and they drilled two holes in my head, and I was in the hospital for a week, and I'm I'm still wondering about whether whether that is going to change my outlook uh, on life. Uh, it's a, certainly the first brush with mortality that I've ever had. And, you know, I've, I feel in many ways like I'm, I've been 20, 29 years old for the last 40 or 45 years, but now I'm thinking a little harder about all of this, but, but, but it, it's very recent, you know? Um, so they had Are to relieve you, pressure. There's some age. swelling. There was swelling of the of the, yeah, of the brain, a, and just oh, had to relieve uh, pressure. I had a it was called a subdural hematoma, which was ble bleeding in the back of it, it, in my skull. And there came a point where they said, <clears throat> you know, I was getting a CAT scan every week, and one one day I went in for a CAT scan, and then I was on my way to dinner, and I got a call from the hospital and said, you need to come in right away. And I said, well, let me go to dinner first, and. I said, no, no, you, you have to come. You don't understand. You have to come in now. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> that had to know, be scary. I was really kind of irritated, but I went in and uh, it's been a week in the hospital. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm thinking much more about those things. Um, uh, and I'm certainly, I'm grateful that, <laughs> that I came out. I, and strangely enough, I, I came out and spent, nine days finishing a novel that I hadn't been able to look at for three months. So um, I think there's a certain gratitude that comes with surviving something like that. Absolutely. You know, I, 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 I never would have guessed. I mean, you look great. You sound great. Uh, the, the, yeah. No, no yeah. sense of, you know, any kind of brain concussion or injury. Well, I have this wild mane of hair because I'm not allowed to, I, I, I haven't been allowed to cut my hair. <laughs> You, have, you shouldn't. It's part have, of your signature. I have this massive, massive scar on my head. Although oh, I'm, is that right? You know. Yeah, although for some reason I didn't shave my head. I don't know why. <laughs> well, you've got a gray head of hair, so you keep that. You won't. You just want to look like Jay McInerney without it. So, Jay, I know <laughs> you're. You're. You've got a hard stop. I really appreciate you taking the time again. Bright Lights, Big City was just a, a seminal novel in, in early in my life, and. um it's just a, a pleasure to get to to meet you and spend some time with you. Uh, uh, thanks Thank for coming you. on the program. Well, I, it's been a pleasure. I really, really appreciate re appreciate revisiting and re uh, rethinking about some of these things. Uh, thanks very much.